Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first in our series of masterclass sessions. This one is going to delve into the, the wonders of A-level psychology. Uh, and through this session, not only will we explore what psychology is, uh, we're also going to take part in some virtual experiments. You will see in the top corner of the screen a code that relates to a website called Slido, slido.com. Uh, uh, and if you enter that code, it will take you to a screen where you can take part in sort of live polls and interactions as we go through. So do feel free to have your phones at the ready. Uh, slido.com is what you want. And if you type in that little code in the top right corner of the screen, that will allow you to access the quizzes and polls that we will take part in as we go through this session. Uh, my name is Mr. Sparks. I'm the vice principal here at Bexley Academy and one of the psychology teachers. And I'm joined by Mr. Wells, who also teaches A-level psychology here at the academy. Uh, Mr. Wells, tell us why is it that you love A-level psychology? Why is it a good course? Oh, I think psychology is fantastic because uh, pupils get to learn a bit about themselves, but also about the other people around them. And you often get uh, pupils leave the classroom kind of looking at each other, understanding why people start to do the, the things they do, uh, which, which I love. I think it's brilliant. And, you, and that leads me nicely on. So in terms of what is psychology and what we study, psychology is the scientific study of the human mind and behaviour. And psychology is all about those big questions out there, uh, the big questions in the world. For example, have you ever wondered why people behave the way they do? Is it due to their genes, what they inherit, or is it due to their upbringing? And those are two big questions that we absolutely explore in A-level psychology. Is it nature or is it nurture, as you might have heard it? Another question, have you ever wondered why people obey orders, especially in schools, as a group of students sitting here this afternoon? Why is it that we follow orders, even when our teachers tell us to do things that we don't always agree with? What is it that forces us to follow those orders? So a second type of question that we study in social psychology. And then have you ever wondered why, whether prison really actually helps to prevent people from committing crime or going back into crime? And these are all the types of things that we will study if you, if you choose to study A-level psychology, which hopefully you will. Now, in terms of here at Bexley Academy, we, we study our entire curriculum based upon some really broad questions. And I'll give you four just to sort of whet your appetite. So why is human memory so unreliable? We study that in a memory topic. And in that, we look at actually if someone witnesses a crime or an accident, and I will test you on this in about 20 minutes time. Um, why is it that we're so bad at remembering the actual details accurately? So really key question there. Uh, why do human beings blindly follow orders without questions? And no doubt you'll be some GCSE history students in the room that will understand the context behind that question. So what is it that allows people to do horrible things in history because they were simply following orders? A third question, what is normal behaviour and what makes some people abnormal? Great topic that Mr. Wells and I have recently finished teaching where we look at loads of different psycho, uh, psychological illnesses like OCD, depression uh, and phobias and look at actually what makes some people classify as normal and some people classify as abnormal. And then finally, one of my favourites, do early childhood experiences affect the rest of your adult life? A really, really big question, but a really, really interesting one to delve into. So through A-level psychology, we study all of those questions and we delve into trying to find out the why. Why is it that our memory is unreliable? Why is it we follow orders? It's all about the why questions, which makes it a great, great subject. Now, with that in mind, we're going to start with a quiz. Uh, and this is where you will need your mobile phones at the ready. Uh, and it's a really simple quiz. Couldn't be more simple, could it, Mr. Wells? It's true and false only. So you've got a 50-50% chance of getting every single question right. To this day, I've done this quiz for about eight years in a row. No one has ever got six out of six on this quiz. So could this be the first time in history that someone gets six out of six? What I'd like you to do, first of all, is join the quiz. So you can either scan that QR code in the top left corner of the screen, or you can go to slido.com and enter your name. Uh, oh, people are joining already. This is great. This is working. T is here. Lauren's here. Welcome, welcome. Megan, welcome. Welcome, David, as well. I'm going to give you a minute to join. Millie LP, welcome. Callum, welcome. Who is going to get on the leaderboard, Mr. Wells? That's the big question. Clearly, number one is confident. No, <laughs> I didn't know if that was Lauren one or LP one. <laughs> Someone with the name of just a heart symbol. Love it. You've got another 30 seconds to join if you're with us. Welcome, Ryan. Jessica C, welcome. Lisanne, welcome. Oh, Lisanne's in the room. Lisanne is a, wins the daily quiz in assembly quite often. So Lisanne, is, is this, are you going to be the first ever student to get six out of six on this quiz? Another 15 seconds to join. And I'd say it couldn't be more simple. The answers are simply true or false. You've got a 50% chance. Five more seconds to join. Four, 
three, two, and one. If you haven't had a chance, I've seen people still join. If you haven't had a chance to join, don't worry, you can still do the questions uh, and join in as you, as you come through. There's loads of people join. I feel like I should wait another 15. So I'm going to give a bonus 15 so I can see people still joining. Some slow typers out there. Five more seconds, but then we are definitely starting. Four, three, two, and one. And here we go. Question number one. So taxi drivers have larger brain regions associated with memory in comparison to non-taxi drivers. Is that true or is it false? You've got eight more seconds to vote. Here we go. Votes are coming in. Very quick, you've got five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Oh, the votes are in, Mr. Wells. The votes are in. Not, oh, wow. This is the group, Mr. Wells. 92% of you have said true. 8% have said false. And that means for 92% of you, you are absolutely spot on. Virtual round of applause to you. Well done. Let's see who's on our leaderboard. A is in first place. A grade. B. Leah in second place. Well done. LD, Hart, Simmel, Millie, you've made the leaderboard already. Here we go. Mr. Wells, question two. What have we got? Question two. So playing uh, the brain training app on the Nintendo DS, does that actually improve the memory and IQ of the people playing it? That is the question. Here we go. Five seconds again. I can see the votes flooding in. Time is up. Oh, here we go. Here we go. 65% saying true, 35% going false. We're going to knock some people out of getting six out of six already here, guys. We will tell you the psychology behind these answers at the end of the quiz. The, the correct answer is false. So well done to the 35% of you said false. Completely fictitious, complete nonsense, those brain training games. And we'll delve into the psychology behind it in a few minutes' time. Question three, here we go. And the next two are linked. So I'm going to read out the next two. And it's to do with twins. So I'm going to give you a bit of context. Psychology teachers and psychologists love studying identical twins. And the reason they love studying identical twins is because identical twins share 100% of their DNA. They are essentially genetically the same person. So what that allows us to explore really interestingly is whether something is as the result of nature, traits we inherit, or whether it's as, as the result of nurture, the environment that we get brought up in. And I've got two questions for you, very sensitive psychology questions, but this is a mature group of students. Let's see how we get on with these. Here's question three. A leaderboard, before we go, is remaining unchanged with number one in top place, full stop in second place. There's some good punctuation there. Christina is now in third, Casey in fourth, Hasa in fifth place. Congratulations. Here's question three then. So if one identical twin, and here's a Zoom picture, a load of identical twins, is homosexual, there's a 50% chance the other twin will be homosexual. So true or false, what do you reckon? Take your time to think. Oh, lots of answers here. I'd love to find out why, and we will discuss why in class. Oh, very mixed reaction to this one. 50-50 split down the middle of the room. Very well, appropriate. Very appropriate, given the question, <laughs> absolutely. Here we go. And this might help you with the next question. The answer is true which is really, really interesting for psychologists, because what that suggests is there is a genetic element to our sexuality. Not, not entirely, though, because if that figure was 100%, it would be genetic, but it's not entirely genetic. But that rate is higher than what we would see in the, the, the population generally. So that means there is a genetic element to homosexuality. Now, that's interesting. Let's see if that will help you answer question four then. So question four is if one identical twin suffers from depression, there's approximately a 45% chance the other twin will also suffer from depression. True or false? What do we think? So is depression genetic? That's the question here. Boats are flooding in. Here we go. I think it helped you out. Amazing stuff. So 58% of you said true, and you'd be right again. So 58% of you are absolutely right. So yes, what that again tells us is there is a genetic element to psych psychological conditions like depression, and that's something we study in the psychopathology topic. Very, very good. Now on to one of my personal favourites, as I trained as a music and psychology teacher. Uh, let's check that leaderboard first, though. Full stop has risen into first place, 49 seconds. Four out of four, the only person who is on four out of four. Then Liz A, three out of four. Congratulations, 34 seconds. A, Christine H, Megan, great, this is good. So that means full stop is the only person who can contend now to get the full six out of six. Mr. Wells, question five, what have we got? So question five, does listening to Mozart actually improve concentration? Which would be great if it was. You can do your homework, you bang on a bit of Mozart, and there you go, you'll work solidly through. But does it work? That is the question. True or false? I love that expression. Bang on a bit of Mozart. I'm sure Mozart would approve. Oh, <laughs> a 50-50 split once again. Here we go. 
50-50 split. Let's put you out of your misery. It's false. A complete lie. That Mozart effect that your teachers might have even referred to uh, at some point during your education is a complete load of nonsense, as you'll find out in a minute's time. Final question. Let's see that leaderboard. It, no one is five out of five. To this day, seven or eight years of doing this quiz, no one has ever got five out of five. I, I remain unbeaten in this quiz. But Megan is now in first place. Let's see who will win it then with our final question. An important one, Mr. Wells. Over to you. So final question, is psychology a science? We know biology is, we know chemistry is, we know physics is, but is psychology up there as well? Is it a science? That is the question, true or false? If they don't get this right, Mr. Wells, it's time for us to leave, I think. Oh, look at that, beautiful. 100%, you're all in the right place. We better see you in our classroom next year, guys. You better be in Mr. Wells' class or my class next year. Uh, psychology is indeed a science, and we told you that right at the start. The winner, a virtual round of applause. Well done, Megan. Five out of six, 53 seconds. Uh, ast uh, astonishing performance. Christina H, well done. Full stop, one. Well done as well. And Lauren, well done. You made it up to the No one has still got six out of six to this day. Uh, we remain unbeaten. But let's let's do some more psychology. Great fun. Thank you for that, guys. I enjoyed that. We'll talk about why, though. Let's answer those questions first. So in terms of that first question, taxi drivers have larger brain regions associated with memory in comparison to non-taxi drivers. Let me give you the psychology behind that. So the answer is true, as we said. And there is research that shows us that a specific part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is right in the middle of the brain, is bigger in people who drive London black taxis than people that don't. And the argument there from psychologists is that that part of the brain actually allows or promotes spatial navigation. And because they spend all day driving taxis, remembering road names, remembering routes, that part of the brain gets bigger. And that's the same for anything in psychology. If you are very, very good at playing a musical instrument, the part of the brain that controls muscle memory for that, for your hands, for example, if you play piano, gets bigger as well. If you play football, the part of the brain that controls foot movement and spatial navigation improves in size or gets bigger in size. So it is absolutely true. Mr. Wells, you're one, number two, so this Dr. Karashima's brain training games. What, what, why, is that, why is that a load of nonsense? Well, I mean, disappointing as it is, because that would be so easy to improve our intelligence and our IQ. However, it's false. It doesn't actually have any effect on whether we can improve our IQ or not. However, a lot of people believe that is true, and that is part of their marketing strategy. Often you'll see on the front cover there be a doctor in a white coat. And that leads us to a second question, which we do look at in psychology, which is why are we more likely to trust somebody if they're wearing a white lab coat? And what we are we just going to believe it? Are we just going to follow along with it? And that brings up some very interesting questions, uh, which we might explore later on uh, in this session as well. Absolutely, absolutely. It's the same reason why many shampoo companies will also put someone advertising in a lab coat, makes you, makes you believe it's more credible. I'm going to answer question three and four. You say this is the twin question, and I've already given you a bit of an indication to the twin research. And twin research is fascinating in psychology, and both of these questions, the answer was true. And what the research is therefore showing us is that many characteristics and traits we have as humans, things like intelligence, things like uh, psychological illnesses, uh, our personality, whether we're aggressive or not, are to some extent controlled by the genes that we inherit. Interestingly though, the result in both question three and four was a 50% chance for question three and a 45% chance for depression in question four. So what that tells us is while we might be at a genetic risk of getting depression, if our family members have a history of it, it doesn't mean we're guaranteed to get it. And the environment also plays a big part in whether or not we will actually get these characteristics and traits. And that's why no twin study has ever shown a 100% concordance rate or rate uh, of people having the same characteristics. The environment does also shape us, but really, really interesting research, twin research, uh, a firm favourite of mine. Mr. Wells, Mozart effects, tell us, why was that, why was that nonsense? Uh, I'm disappointed with this one. It would be great if I could put some Mozart on and just work flat out. Um, but unfortunately, it isn't true. And so he has shown that, uh, that, that listening to Mozart does not help our concentration. However, there is a link between listening to music and our ability to complete tasks and work. Uh, music with a particularly fast tempo, for instance, we were then to complete the task to that tempo, to that beat. Uh, Mozart, which has a generally quite skippy and, uh, and faster tempo than other classical musics, uh, might then allow us to do uh, task more quicker uh, because we're listening to it. But there's nothing specific about Mozart. It would be the same if you listen to rock music at the same tempo, perhaps. Um, 
Brilliant. Thank you, Mr. Wolves. Yeah, really interesting. It's all about the speed, not the not the composer itself. And the final one is psychology of science. Well, of course it was. And we told you right at the start of this video, the psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental functions. And that's the American Psychological Association definition right there for you on screen. Uh, so, yeah, we classify this subject as a science in the same way when you go on to do a degree in psychology as we would with biology, chemistry, physics, etc. Brilliant stuff. So that brings us to the end of the quiz. We've got two more experiments for you. And the next one's a firm, firm favourite of mine. I'm going to run the experiment and then Mr. Wells gets the pleasure of talking to you about the psychology. On my desk, I've currently got a jar of sweets uh, and they're not for you to eat. Uh, I hope Mr. Wells didn't eat any earlier because I had to count these. I'm going to show you this jar of sweets. Now I'm going to hold it up to the camera. It's not a massive, massive jar, uh, but it did take, I've got a spare bag of Skittles here. This jar of sweets did take and there are other good brands of sweets out there, I might just add at this point in time. This jar of Skittles did take about six or seven of those big bags. So it's actually surprisingly deceptive how many are squeezed into this jar. I'm just going to keep it held up to the camera. And I'm going to put an open question on the screen. And your job is to tell me, guess a number. How many sweets do you think are in this jar? And I'm going to give you about 30 seconds just to type in any number you want. And there are oh, some people have already typed in their numbers. We've got some high guesses here. 978, that is high. 950, 892. 785 800 you've got 30 seconds ladies and gents on that same slido poll top in how many sweets you think are in this jar for me let's see what we come up with it's quite heavy as well actually 500 300 789 i like the specificity of that particular answer 1500 1200 850 oh my word it's heavy i'm telling you that 468 what I should have said is if you get the right number, you can have the jar of sweets, shouldn't I? That's that's how the old fairground works, isn't it? 694, 650, 318. Oh, wow. You've got another 10 seconds to keep your guesses coming in. 990, 826, 1,085, 456. It's got a big range, haven't we here, sir? Massive range. They're in the lid as well, just in case you can't see. And there is no tennis ball inside. There's no tricks in here. Pure sweets. Five seconds. We're going very low now. We're going both ends six of the spectrum. Bags into it, guys. Six bags of Skittles. It's got to be at least 100 in those, isn't it? It's got to be. Got to be. Right, pause there. You've had some thinking time. You've seen the jar of sweets. I wonder if the answers would change if I made, made my picture bigger and made the jar bigger. Maybe it's a visual illusion. Who knows? Here we go. Pause there. Some great answers. Nine, eight, six. Now, what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to move forward now, is that on the next slide, oh, pardon, let me go back one. On this slide, is one of the, the is the correct answer i have actually counted these and mr wells you didn't eat any, any earlier did you when i was out of the room <laughs> not many not many, many. Okay. the correct answer is on the screen so 872 772 all the way down to seven or two i don't think it's going to be those two though and i'm going to put a poll on the screen and i'd like you to select now the answer that you think is correct and the correct answer is among one of those suggestions and your job is to select the correct one um if you no let's just leave it at that that's all i'm going to say on that one so Let's pop the next poll on screen. I'm just going to give you all time to get in there, which I think you have. And what I'd like you to do, here we go. How many sweets in jar? 15 seconds. Select the answer that you want to go for, please. Oh, lots of votes flooding in. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, wow. What a mix. Oh, we got, so we've got 20% of our respondents said 772, 20% said 662. We've got 32% said 472. We've got 16% 372, zero of you thought 272, which is hilarious. 172, 8%, 72. No one went with 7 or 2. I'm really glad that none of you went with 7 or 2. Hopefully you can see. Fascinating. You've dodged the correct answer collectively as a group between you. That is beautifully done there the correct answer is 272 minus the four or five that i might have eaten after counting them today which is interesting my question is though did you really think there was these numbers on screen three seven two four seven two six seven two seven seven two or did the way we set the experiment up change your mind in some way because this is a psychology experiment after all and have i somehow influenced you mr wells talk talk us through let's see oh this is the leaderboard from previously so we'll ignore megan's topic mr wells talk us about the psychology behind this what's 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 going on here well the experiment you guys have just taken part of was an experiment a very famous experiment that's been done before and was first done by uh, by janice in 1932 
And the experiments to look at conformity about people uh, going along with the group. You might have heard the expression following like sheep. That is exactly what conformity is all about. And his expression used an ambiguous situation involving a glass bottle filled with beans, just like you just done. And he asked participants individually to estimate how many beans the bottle contained. OK, once he'd done this, he then put the, the contestants in a group and they then had to create an answer as a group. Similarly to what you just done when you were asked if you would then vote again and change your answer. Now, interestingly, what they found is that nearly all the participants changed their answers. As soon as they were put in a group with other people, they, their original thoughts were out the window and they changed to fit in with the group to, to, to uh, see what they were saying as well. Now, interestingly, females actually changed their answers more into a greater amount than males do. You may be wondering why that is, and that is for a, a conversation experiment for another day. It could be that uh, men are just more stubborn and girls, uh, you know, strive to be correct much more than boys do. Perhaps that's why girls do better in exams <laughs> overall. Who knows? Brilliant. And really, really interesting you say that. And if you look at the changes of estimates on the screen there, a huge average change in estimates. So females changing their estimates by 300, on average, 382. And I'm sure that happened to you there. Um, not that we can ask you, but I'm sure you're sitting at home thinking, I knew there wasn't that many. The correct answer is about 200. And we manipulated that whole setting because actually some of the answers that were on the screen first, we'd already put on for you. Those ones at 850, 900, we made up and put on before you'd even entered the room to try and manipulate your answer and push your answer up. It works the same way. Mr. Wells and I did this with our classes and Mr. Wells did it the opposite way where he, the first answers he put on screen were the the lowest answers, ones around 100, 50, and the same thing happened. People move their answer to be correct and try and get closer to what they perceive to be the correct answer. And this happens in the real world. The reason we've shown this, this is a, a case of psychology in action. If you ever go to a fair and there's the guess the number of sweets in the jar and there's a form you fill in, the form always has some names at the top that were already written there before the fair had even started. And the numbers are there to put you off, to change your estimates, make you conform to the number that they want you to and take you away from the wrong answer. So it's, it's just a case of psychology in everyday life in action. Hope that works on you and hope you found that interesting. Here's, here's the next one. So that was social psychology. Why do we behave the way we do? What we're going to look at now is cognitive psychology. Two very short videos and very short experiments to share with you, with you this afternoon. And I'm sure they will work. I can already see. Um, that people are asking questions, which is great. If you do have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A section on the Slido app, and then right at the end of this session, we'll post your questions on screen and we'll answer them. So some good questions coming through already about entry requirements and whether it goes with health, and we will answer those. So we, we've not forgotten about them, which is great. Cognitive psychology, my favourite area here. Now, I'm going to show you a video, and the video does all of the explaining for me, OK? Uh, but I'll give you a little bit of a heads up with this video. What your job is to do is to count the number of times there's going to be two teams playing basketball, a team that are wearing white shirts and a team that are wearing black shirts. And your job is to count simply the number of times that the team in white passed the ball. I'm not going to make you type it in this time. You can just shout it at the screen when it comes up. So how many times did the team in white pass the ball to one another? Let's see how you get on. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! And hopefully you saw it second time round. Moonwalking in from the right hand side of the screen to the left there. Really powerful demonstration of something in psychology that I absolutely love. And that theory is called inattentional blindness um, or perceptual blindness. It has two names. It occurs when an individual or a person fails to perceive something unexpected, even though it's in plain sight, because you'd expect you'd see that, but you didn't, which is really interesting. And the reason I didn't pause that video is it works on most people first time. And if you've seen it before, it certainly won't work on you again. Here's a better video, though, and I'm going to give you a really clear instruction to this. And this is the final part of today's session, uh, and I hope you enjoy. I'm going to show you a video. 
now, and I'm going to actually tell you what happens in advance. As the scenery moves around in this video, so the camera will pan around from left to right, lots of things in the scene will change when they return back to the original position. I'm going to give you one, and I'm going to ask you how many change in total. So one of them, there is a suit of armour stood in the corner, or a bear originally, sorry, stood a statue of a bear, and that statue will turn into a suit of armour the second time the camera goes around. So that is one of the changes. Your job is to count the number of different things in the scene that change as you watch this video, okay? So I'm going to put the video on. Just count. Here we go. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? And that is the question for us. How observant are you? Now, I'm going to put a, a, a question on the screen and you can type a number, but actually I'd like you to do this in one of two ways. Firstly, I'd like you to type the number of changes that you spotted in that video. It might be three, four, five, six, seven. Once you've typed your number, I'd then like you to type in what the change is. Ten, oh, wow, 10. Excellent. I'd like you to start typing in for me so we can build up a collection of what the changes were. And I gave you one. The bear turned into a suit of armour. If we've spotted 10, what are they? Start typing them in. What are the things that have changed? And let's see, between all of us, between the, the, the 50 plus of us here this afternoon, if we can work out what the 14, woo, 14, that's got to be the highest yet. What what things changed? I want to see some lists now. If you're going to state a number like 21, I need to know what's changed. So start typing for me. What things have changed in that clip? You're getting numbers. This is good. Two, six, eight. What a range, though, Mr. Wells. Should just see if they conform to each other and start putting answers closer to each other. That's true. I'm not seeing any suggestions yet of what's changed. Who's going to be the brave first answer? No, Three, the bear, the clock, and what the man was holding. The hat colour. Good. Okay, good. What else? I'm going to give you a minute for this, because this is our final thing. The rolling pin into something metal. Correct. Good. Hey, old people are typing the whole thing. No wonder. The, oh, my word. I can't keep up now. It's so good. The wallpaper, clock on the ground, pictures, wallflowers on the table, animal head on the wall. I'd love to know who that person is that spotted all those. Ten clock, armour lamp in the back. Oh, this is amazing. This is very, very good. We've got an observant audience here, Mr. Wells. 30 more seconds. See what people have typed in. Wallpaper, clock, ground, pictures, wallflowers, table, animal head. Inspector's coat. Very, very good. Very, very good. Twelve. <laughs> This is good. Five more seconds to see what anyone's written. But fascinating set of responses here, ladies and gents, because we've had responses all the way from one or two up to 21, I think, was the highest. Lots of you listing many of the key things, the bear, the clock on the wall, the rolling pin, the suit of armour, the lamp, the hat, the inspector's coat, the flowers. Very, very good. A very observant audience. I'm going to move forward and then I'm going to show you the same clip again, zoomed out so you can see what actually changes. Whoever the person was who spotted 21, hats off to you, that person, metaphorically speaking, because it is actually 21, which is incredible. So if you put five or six, that is the common answer in this video. Most people say about five or six. So even when I've told you to look out for something, many of you only spotted five or six changes. Let's watch the video clip to see what actually changed. Well done, though, if you said 21. Incredible. Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. I'm not sure anyone said the actor on the floor, but incredible, though. And 
I already explained to you the concept behind this one, which was inattentional blindness. This was something different called change blindness. Even when things were changing in front of your very eyes, you still didn't know this. And there have been brilliant experiments in psychology. One of my favorites is where someone walks into a shop and the person who is serving them ducks below the counter and then their identical twin stands up wearing a completely different color shirt. So it goes from like a bright blue to a bright pink shirt. Most people don't even notice. They wouldn't even notice the person has changed or what the person is wearing has changed. So that's called change blindness. Two cognitive psychology topics, which are really, really great fun. It's bringing us near the end. So Mr. Wells, tell us, where, where can A-level psychology take us if we, if we decide to take A-level psychology? Now, there may be some of you thinking about already at university and what they're going to go on to do a degree, or maybe you don't want to limit yourself into what degree you can choose based on your A-levels. Well, psychology A-level can lead you to lots of different degrees. Um, I mean, some of the degrees there uh, list obviously psychology being the obvious one, uh, but then English, sociology, business studies, teaching, sport and exercise and law. And I think those bottom, those bottom four are the really interesting ones for me, because I think that understanding the way people think, the way people learn, it can just be so important when you're working with a business, working with a team and teaching and sport coaching, working as a group. Um, and law as well. And in fact, we're going to look at a unit in psychology about eyewitness testimonies that will be really important when coming into doing law. Um, so lots of different range of things. You don't just have to do psychology if you study psychology. It's helpful in loads of things. Absolutely. And it's become the second most popular A-level after A-level maths. It's always fighting for third, second and third place with A-level biology. But it's one of the most popular A-levels out there. Uh, final piece of information for me before we look at, uh, and I've seen some more questions coming in, which are great. Possible careers it leads to, Mr. Wells summarised it beautifully, that psychology is everywhere. And many people who work in marketing, in business, in accounting, in human resources, have all got backgrounds or can have backgrounds in psychology, nursing, teaching, and someone's asked the question about health and social care already, which is a great question. Does it go well with health and social care? Absolutely, the two subjects go hand in hand beautifully. And it is in every aspect of the world we live in, which makes it such a relatable course to so many different careers. So whatever you want to do, psychology will, will put you in a really good position. Now that does bring us to the end. Uh, and I can see some questions coming in, which is which is great. I can see another one that's going to pop up on screen now once I've accepted it. Um, are there any entry requirements? A very common question, a very good question. And here, what I would say to you is a lot of schools will say uh, that you need to be really, really good at maths or you need to be really good at biology. And I slightly disagree with them on that. For me, there are a lot of essays within A-level psychology. And that question has disappeared, I can see already. Uh, there are a lot of essays in A-level psychology. And as a result of that, being a strong writer, so having that five in English, I think is very, very important. It's about being able to write an argument. Uh, so for me, the five in English, I think is more important than the maths. Someone did ask about maths. So I will say that 10% of the course's GCSE maths level skills things like calculating percentages, interpreting a graph, but it, it's nothing more than you do at GCC. So nothing to fear if you're looking to do A-level psychology. Uh, someone's asked me how many exams are there and does it have coursework? Uh, the answer to that question is there are three exams at the end of the second year. Uh, so really, really good question. Does it have coursework? No, it doesn't. So it all comes down to those three exams at the end of year two. They're all evenly weighted, so a third for each particular paper. Uh, so more questions coming in. How hard is it? Great question. I don't know, Mr. Wells, how hard is A-level psychology? I think for me, I'll answer it first then, Mr. Wells, you can add. Um, I think for me, what you'll find, because each term you tend to study a different topic. So over the course of the two years, you will study nine or 10 different psychological topics. And there'll be some that you absolutely love that you will therefore find easy. There'll be some that you don't enjoy as much, and that's the case in any subject. And it might be those ones you find more tricky. Many students find biopsychology hard. I think that's probably the hardest one for me. Mr. Wells, well, I don't know, what's the hardest one for you? Yeah, I think biopsychology for me is, is similar, um, similar difficulty for me. But I think that that's a, a key thing. And there'll be elements of it that you really enjoy. And if you enjoy it, there's nothing holding you back. Um, so don't be intimidated. If psychology is something that you think you are, uh, that you're really interested in, but maybe you've struggled with maths or essay writing and you think possibly this isn't for me. If you really enjoy it and you are interested in it, then don't let it hold you back and you will do you will do fine. And we're here to support you with that as well. And we will support you every step of the way if you put in the effort and you, uh, you show us your interest. Absolutely, absolutely. We're going to take, I realise we've already run over, but we'll take another two minutes of questions. Uh, so how hard is it with answers? Is it like health studies with case studies? Absolutely. There are many similarities between uh, A-level psychology and health and social care. And that's why they go really, really, really well together. Um, what I would say is that there are studies and they are like case studies in a way. So we learn a lot of research studies as we go through the course to support our arguments. So yes, is the short answer to that question. Um, 
Oh, great question, Melissa. What's the most interesting topic? I don't know. My mind changes on that every year. I love a topic called attachment, which is all to do with how children form attachments to their parents and the impact that has on the rest of their lives. Mr. Wells, what's your favourite topic? Oh, mine has to be social. Uh, why do people follow orders? Why do you do what you do? Uh, I think it's a great one to do in a school setting as well. Why do you Why do you follow our instructions when we stand in front of the class? Uh, it's a fantastic one to delve into. Callan, that's a really good question, uh, and I, I completely empathise with that question. Uh, I, I tend to not write. I type all of my work now. Uh, yes, you, if your normal way of working is typing on a Chromebook or a laptop, that can be an arrangement we, we absolutely make. Uh, and I've known many students that, uh, that I've taught over the years that have typed their essays. And it's more about, a cons when I say essays, they're not big essays like English or history. Very short, concise essays, no more than 500 words. So while there are a lot of essays, they're actually quite short relative to your other subjects. And so don't let that put you off. And absolutely, we can find a way of working the works you oh my word the questions are flooding in now are we going to start with i'm trying to keep on top of these questions now uh are we going to start with topics that are easy and engage people first or a bit of both number one <laughs> a bit of both because uh, what we don't want to do is give you all the easy fun topics day one because uh, that would be unrealistic so we, we we do a little bit of both so the first few weeks actually mr what mr wells and i did was give students an introduction to all of the different topics so a bit of biopsychology a bit of the research methods a bit of social psychology a bit of psychopathology deliberately so that actually you get a sense of what the whole course is about and then you'll know if it's the right course for you so no i don't just sell you all the easy topics day one have i missed any what gcse topics is it most similar to a lot of similarities with sociology. Uh, and I can see people say thank you now, which is great. Oh my word, so many questions. I'm, gonna let, I'm not gonna accept any more, but what we will do is we'll, we'll take a log of these and we'll certainly answer them through the website. So that's not a problem at all. Um, let's see which ones I've missed. GCC have answered. What'll be the first topic we'll learn about? We do them all actually, Saf, very deliberately in the beginning. So we give you a little overview of each topic just so you get a sense of what the different topics are. And then this year, straight off that, we did start with Mr. Wells' favorite, social psychology. Megan, only two, but you only need Mr. Wells and I for A-level psychology. You couldn't ask for two better teachers, and I would say that. How many topics are there in total? There are 17 in total, but there are options within that. So in year two, we actually select three options out of nine, and we discuss with the students and work out which ones they like the most. So to give you a bit of a, an insight, you can study either aggression, either forensic psychology, or even addiction. And this year we did addiction, but we can change that. So uh, there are options that we can choose. Brilliant. I can see that, that. I think we've got to the bottom of the questions. Mr. Wells, anything to add before we conclude today? No, I don't think so. We've covered everything. If you get anybody has any more questions, please do get in contact with us um, either through the school website um, because we're more than happy to answer anything. And we hope to see as many of you as we can uh, next year because I'm the firm believer it is the best subject that, uh, that we do at Bexley Youth Academy. And, and that's not, there are other subjects out there. That's not an unbiased opinion there at all, Mr. Wells, is it? Uh, yes. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Hope you, A, found that useful uh, and a little bit enjoyable, just to give you a bit of a flavour of what psychology is. This series will continue to this same time next week, so half three next week. Mr. McPaul will be here telling us about the wonders of A-level history and what that entails. So if you're interested, slightly interested, do join that session this time next week. I'm looking forward to that one myself. I'll be a participant in that one. Uh, but in the meantime, if you've got any other questions, you've got my email address, you've got Mr. Wells' email address, drop us an email and we will be in touch with the answer to that. But thank you ever so much for your active participation. And we will see those of you who are at the Academy back in the Academy relatively soon. Uh, and those of you joining us next year uh, in a classroom next year. Bye for now, everyone.